How many of you have found yourself in this particular situation? The man in the red has just made an offer of freedom from death and sin to a sin-sick man. He has no need or responsibility to feel awkward about asking that particular question. The man in the green has placed his taste of coffee ahead of his eternal life. He has been blinded basically by the lust of the flesh. This particular cartoon says an awful lot about the condition of our city, our county, our state, and our nation. We reject the word of Christ frequently. And when we offer a Bible study with someone, we should not feel awkward if they reject us. They're the ones that ought to feel awkward. Because they're rejecting the word of God and eternal life. You know, spring is coming. And we're not going to be able to use cold weather as a pretext for not getting out and telling others about Christ and his kingdom. It's not about how we feel. It's about doing what the Lord commanded us to do. And that's to teach everyone. We know that it is impossible for us to grow as a church if we cannot tell other people about the church that the Lord built. We will just shrink and die away unless we get out there and tell other people. We also know that there will be no excuse in God's eyes for our not telling other people and obeying his command to tell them. Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. As long as we're the Lord's children, he will be with us. There is no reason for us to feel awkward when we ask somebody if they want to study the word of God. There are many things that we can do to give ourselves more comfort in that particular realm. We know that we need to speak intelligently to people. We need to know what their level of concern is and whether or not we can accommodate them in their teachings. This level of intelligence requires that we study. If we don't study, how are we going to teach them? We need to know more than they do when we go to teach them about what the Word of God is. It tells us in 1 Timothy 4 verse 13, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. That word reading there implies that we need to study, doesn't it? We need to read the Word of God. Till I come, give attention to reading. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this you will save both yourselves and those who hear you. Because the better you know the word of God, the more completely you can follow his will and help save yourself through the knowledge of the word of Christ. That's 1 Timothy 4, verse 16. Take heed to what you read and continue in the stat statutes of Christ. Don't be lost. Don't step aside. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. We also need to use common sense. You know, we all have the ability to think and make decisions, and most times we can make good, credible decisions about the things that we're doing. The Lord tells us in um, Colossians 4, verse 6, Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. 
How do we season our speech with salt? Well, we study the Word of God and we know what it is. And we use godly language. We don't use worldly language. As we talk to these people, we become a good example for them at that time. We also will find ourselves in situations where we need to use self-restraint. We need to avoid the worldly madness and the mannerisms that the world has when we're trying to teach other people. If we season our speech with grace and with salt, then we won't be of the world as these people that we're talking to are. Let your words be filled with God's grace, not your language, or your doctrine be of this world. But use God's grace. Don't use this worldly language. You know, when we're in the world, Satan is there. He is there to tempt us, and he will tempt us at every opportunity he gets to do so. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but that what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. We can all do that. We can all impart grace to the hearers by edifying ourselves so that we can edify them. You know, my high school motto in our class was simplicity denotes distinctiveness. In other words, the simpler it is and the plainer it is to see and understand, the more distinct it becomes. It says in Colossians, in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3, But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Christ's message is very simple, isn't it? Obey my will. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live faithfully. That's a very simple message. It does not have to be extremely complicated where people cannot understand it. We must also be able to speak incrementally. Don't try to teach everything that you know or think you know in one setting. It can't be done. We've all suffered from information overload. At one time or another, we receive so much information, we can't process it. You may have to go and teach somebody four or five different times to get the basics in there, but make sure they don't suffer from information overload. They have the ability and the time to understand what you're trying to teach them. You know, sometimes we even have to speak to them as if they were a child, that they had no clue what you're talking about. And when you're talking about the Bible, most people do not have a clue about some of the things in the Bible. Just for example, think about who Micaiah was, the prophet Micaiah. That'll tell you what you know concerning the Word of God. You know, Jesus used this principle. After three years, he realized that he still had not been able to teach all 12 of the disciples, the apostles, what they needed to know. In John 16, verse 12, he said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. His solution was to send the Holy Spirit to teach them further. But he taught them incremental, incrementally while he was here. We also need to speak intuitively. You know, as uh, true fishers of men, we may need to develop an evangelistic perception about us. We know the area where we're going to be talking, usually right here in Ranger. And we may speak to somebody that is not a godly man in that area. We also know that if it's an ungodly man in an ungodly era, we probably found somebody that might listen to the Word of God. But quite frequently, it will be a total rejection, as it has been most of the cases. 
Intuitively, though, we can make many correct decisions and deductions about a person by talking to him, hearing what he has to say, knowing where he works, what his financial condition is, whether or not he's hungry, his physical appearance. There are many things that will tell you that he may or may not be interested in the Word of God. But you can make that deduction intuitively by looking at the individual and talking with him. You know, if you're understanding your prospect's background, that will shed light on your understanding of what they know. And this, if, if you have the opportunity, will allow you to ward off some questions and things that uh, appear to create arguments or difficult situations that you're not prepared to answer. You know, Paul intuitively perceived that part of his accusers were Pharisees and part of them were Sadducees. And so he used that to his advantage to start an argument among them and they forgot about his trial and he walked off. Acts 23 verse 6, But when Paul perceived that one part of the Sadducees and Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. That's what he was being tried for. And the fight was on. He intuitively knew what would cause that particular situation to erupt. Speaking uh, illustratively is also another thing that we need to do. That's a big word for use the illustrations. And we always use illustrations, even with our children. A good illustration may be the difference between making your point and losing a soul to Satan. So it may be very important to use illustrations from time to time. Some points may be hard for non-Christians to understand without a good illustration. A way to direct their minds in difficult biblical points. We can think of illustrations that will do that. We have to remember that a picture is worth a thousand words. If you can put a picture in their mind, you can save lots of words. You know, when you look at Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus used a lot of illustrations. He described his disciples as the light of the world. He described them as a city set on a hill. And he was on a mountain at that time, and some of his listeners were from Jerusalem. And so they each knew what they were talking about. He said, you are the salt of the earth, but if a salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. He also said, you are the light of the world, a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do they hide a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives out light to all who are in the house. So let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do we act like that? When we're talking to other people about God, do we let our light shine? Some of the things that we need to think about is being a good example and having good illustrations like Jesus did. And seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain where he was seated. His disciples came to him. And then he taught them from there. And great multitudes followed him. You know, an illustration uh, can be used for almost anything, even unworthiness. Unworthiness. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the fields, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? This individual that he was talking to may have been worthless. He may have been useless. But he was worried or he wouldn't have been talking to the Lord. The worthlessness of worry is explained in this particular passage. What good does it do you to worry? If you ask somebody for a Bible study and they turned you down, don't worry about it. 
It is their soul and their decision. You know, if we illustrated the hypocrisy of the Pharisees, Jesus did this by using a hyperbole. We know what a hyperbole is? It is an intended exaggeration. That's a hyperbole. One of my favorite ones is, I've told you a million times not to do that. How long would it take me to tell you something a million times? Be a long, long time, wouldn't it? Jesus used hyperboles. He said, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not consider the plank in your own eye? That's a hyperbole. An exaggerated situation, Matthew 7, verse 3. Jesus illustrated the way to heaven. He said it was a restricted and narrow way and that the road to hell was a broad way. That's not a hyperbole, that's true. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Matthew 7 verse 13. He also describes false teachers as wolves in sheep's clothing. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Matthew 7 verse 15. He illustrated the blessings of obedience for those who had a firm foundation on which to stand. And the rain descended and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded upon a rock. Matthew 7, verse 25. You know, the church is described as a kingdom in Matthew 16. It has a king. It has subjects. It has laws. It has boundaries. And they're not worldly boundaries. They're spiritual and heavenly boundaries. We have the laws, the laws of Christ. We are the subjects to the king, and the king is Christ himself. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16, verse 19. There is a body, and it has one head. And that body is in subjection to the head. Just as we and subjects are in subjection to the king. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Colossians 1 verse 18. We are subject to that head just as a husband is to her wife. The husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Ephesians 5, verse 23. Same way with marriage there. There is one husband and one wife. Just like in the church, there is one head. Husband loves your wife just as Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for her. We also need to speak insistently. Insistently. You know it tells us in Proverbs 23 verse 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. It also says buy wisdom and instruction and understanding. And we get these things by studying the Word of God. That's where the truth is. We cannot change the truth to accommodate other people. The truth will speak for itself. And you can direct their minds to the Scripture and show them where the truth is. If they are of a true spirit, they will admit that the Word of God is truth. Just as John said it was. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. John 17 verse 17. 
You remember reading about Numbers 22, Balaam and Barak? Barak offered Balaam a large sum of money to come and curse the people of Israel, get them off his land. Balaam said, well, let me ask God. And God said, don't go. Don't curse my people. So they came back and said, well, here's a whole bunch more money. How about a house full? So he went to God again, and God said, well, go ahead. But don't say anything other than what I tell you. What had God told him? He told him not to go. But he went anyway because of his greed. Saddled up his donkey, and away he went. And the donkey turned away from the gate. So he beat him and drove him back. And the donkey started through the gate and crushed his leg. He got off and beat the donkey. And the donkey said, why are you beating me? Haven't I been a good servant all of your life? I had you all, you've had me all these years, and I've never done this. Then the Lord opened his eyes, and he saw. The Lord was persistent with him. You're not going to go down there and get that money. That's what he wanted, but not what the Lord wanted. We know also about 1 Kings 22. I asked you about that name earlier. Remember Saul, I remember Saul, uh, Judah and Israel, Ahab and Josiah, no, Jehoshaphat, was the kings of those two nations. And um, Ahab wanted to go to war with Syria. And so he asked Judah, Jehoshaphat, to join him. And Jehoshaphat said, well, don't we have some prophets to tell us what's going to happen? And he said, oh yeah, we got all these guys and we got Micaiah over here who never says anything good about me. So we don't talk to him. So they sat before all of the prophets and all the prophets say, yeah, go to war, go to war, go to war. But Micaiah didn't. They went, they got him and brought him before there and he said, no, you ought not do that. He was persistent in it. And finally, they asked him why he was persistent in it. He said, well, I had a vision from the Lord. And a spirit came to the Lord when the Lord said, who's going to convince Ahab to go fight with the Syrians? And the spirit said, I'll do it. I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of their prophets. And the Lord said, let it be. And that's why all these prophets were lying to the kings. But not Micaiah. And the angel of the Lord, well, let me find that. Then the messenger who had gone to call Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Now listen, the words of the prophet with one accord encouraged the king. Please let your words be like the words of one of them and speak encouragement. And Micaiah said, as the Lord lives, whatsoever the Lord says to me, that I will speak. He was persistent in keeping the Lord's word. Wasn't like Balaam was in that particular time. If we go to Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 14, Jesus said, Are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile a man. You know, Jesus was intent upon his disciples understanding that it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles an individual. He would reiterate this fact so that they could understand. He was persistent. When you go to um, John chapter 6, you'll see that there are many hard sayings that Jesus had for the people. But worldly people don't want to change. Therefore, they were hard sayings for them. And that from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Many people in this world cannot take the Word of God because they will not listen. And we can be as intent as we want to, but that does not mean that they will listen. 
You know, the Bible speaks of the church in only two ways. The local congregation and, of course, the universal church. So what does that mean? That means that there is no scriptural room for a denominational concept of the church. There is only one church. In Ephesians 5 verses 23 through 32, you'll see it uses 12 nouns and pronouns to describe the church, all of which are singular. There are no pluralities there, it's singular. Therefore, there is only one church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, not my churches. You know, we're not concerned with who's right. We need to be concerned with what is right. And where would we find what is right? Well, the Bible is right. So when we know what's right, the who's right will take care of itself. We'll know who's right when we know what the Word of God says. And that's what we need to teach people throughout the world, that that's what the case is. What's right is that we follow the plan of salvation produced by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because He is the Son of God. And He gave His life for us. And this is a gift from Him, this plan of salvation. We need to listen intently and understand the Word of God. So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. Belief is developed by a full understanding of that word, reading and studying and getting to know what it means. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name, John 20, verse 31. You know, knowing the deadly nature of sin, Jesus Himself said, I have not come to call the righteousness, but sinners to repentance. Luke 5, verse 32. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. Repentance is required for us. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, requires us to confess that Jesus is the Son of God and confess it before men. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in Him, and he and God. 1 John 4, verse 15. And all of these things are of no value to you unless your sins are washed away in the waters of baptism. And you live a faithful life for Christ until he comes. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Now you're talking about the simplicity of the gospel. There it is. Believe or be condemned. Mark 16 verse 16. Erring Christians. We know we err from time to time. We need to pray for forgiveness. Repent of those sins and pray for forgiveness. What we need to do is have you come to Jesus while we stand and sing.